Hey, what's going on YouTube and welcome to this impromptu video on how to set up ESXi for a lab type environment with viral GNS3 or pretty much anything that you want really. Um, ESXi in general is a pretty big topic and there's a lot of different things that you can do. Um, but since I'm setting this up from scratch, I thought I would um, just show you one way on how I'm doing it in case you're interested. And as I go through, I'll explain why I'm doing it a certain way. But just keep in mind, ESXi, if you haven't used it, there's a lot you can do with it. So to begin with, I just set up, uh, I, I got some new hard drives for one of my servers and set up a new RAID 5 and, you know, just put a fresh install of ESXi. I haven't done any configuration on it other than give it a, a management IP and that's it. You don't need a big server. Uh, you can run this on a desktop of any kind because the software here doesn't even know about the RAID. So even if you just have a single hard drive, it that's fine. So anyway, now that we're logged in to the main panel, uh, oh, and I should mention too, one thing I don't recall it seeing this on other servers, but when I installed ESXi 6.5, I just did a fresh, you know, install. And it actually said that my processor is um, may not be supported in future versions. So I've never seen that message before. I'm sure some of you may have, but I just thought that was interesting because uh, it's like, man, I always try to any servers I get, I try to get old um, because that's the only way I can afford it anyway. I <laughs> uh, can't spend 10 grand on a brand new server. So um, I try to keep mine under 300 bucks if possible. So uh, we'll see if you know this will cause problems in the future, but at least for this load, it should work. Uh, so under configuration here, I'm gonna go down to networking. And as you can see, um, and if you just gotta remember that this here is a virtual switch. So just keep that in mind. There's a software-based switch on the physical hardware that then connects to whatever device you have. So if you're just using like a little Linksys router or something that is plugged into, or, you know, a commercial type switch, uh, just keep that in mind. By default, there, it's not gonna do any tagging. It's gonna be like any normal host. So in my case, I have a 3750 switch that's connected to it. And since I'm gonna be using viral, I'm gonna be using different VLANs. And I do want to be able to from any network in my within my home network be able to talk to the vlan and have it come in on this network interface and get into the virtual switch environment that the devices are on so in that case what i could do is i could either add another if you have more than one nick like this you can add additional nick cards uh, and you know configure different vlans uh, in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm just using the one and I'm going to uh, configure it as a trunk. Well, it actually already is. Let me log into my switch. I'll show you how that's set up. Um, so if we go to uh, properties and go to the network management, you can see the actual MAC address here. So it ends in 23.8. Um, and so we can say, what would I say? Not 23.8, 23.80. So this is on uh, gig uh, 1023. And so here I can, you can see that I uh, have a description. A, it's set up for trunk port and because the mode is trunk, ignores this. I have DSCP enabled uh, or uh, trusted and spanning tree port fast and actually it could uh, uh I, i've changed moved some of these uh, ports around uh port fast trunk so now um so spanning tree port fast trunk and then uh this can be dangerous spanning tree bpdu filter if you do it between two different switches and on both sides so if you want to see a real spanning tree loop in action that's what you can do but um, with viral and the way that I use the remote desktop, sometimes when I have uh, set up actual uh, layer two switches and trunks, sometimes they'll shut the port down. And that'd be another reason why you'd want to use another NIC card. So if it shuts down that port, then when BPDUs come through, then, um, you know, it won't 
disconnect your management interface, but since I'm only using the one uh, NIC card, whenever I put that in there, then it just works and I don't have any issues. So then the other thing is uh, if we look at the VLANs, uh, the main ones here that we want to pay attention to are the flat, flat1, snat, and int. These are ones that are going to be used by viral. Now you don't need these on your actual switch, um, but like I say, in my case, I'm going to be using these uh, and I want it to be accessible from any of my network devices. So in addition to that, um, I actually have a, a virtual interface a VLAN 200 uh, with an IP address so that it can route between my different networks. And uh, we do, uh, let's see, what was that, 23? Oops, not show run, just show int. Boom. All right, so now you can see that's using using 8021 is set for trunk. Native VLAN is one. Um, I don't know if they teach ISL anymore in CCNA, but basically in this case, in, uh, in regard to 802.1Q, that just means that's the untagged, which you can see here, VLAN none is untagged for this virtual switch. So what we want to do, uh, I'll scooch this over here. Let's see, move this up and let's do this. We'll do our show VLAN again. So we got our 200, 201, 202, 203. So let's go ahead and first create these and I'm going to create these within the same uh, switch group. Now, if, let's say you don't want uh, any external connectivity uh, what you could do is just add another switch group and but don't use any physical NIC cards just uncheck the NIC cards and you could just call this like silo network and you could make this all so um, any devices that you set up you can use any VLAN you want and it will all stay within this switch group but there's no physical adapters so broadcast messages going out won't um, actually go out your physical interface but in my case what I'm gonna do is actually build upon this and so uh, I'm gonna call one uh, let's see, oops say flat is going to be uh, VLAN 200 next and then flat one is going to be 201 and snat is going to be 202 and int is going to be 203 so now you can see these groups, these switch groups, are part of this same virtual switch. So any broadcasts from here that are sent is actually going to go out this network interface as well. And I do want that in this case because we're going to be talking between uh, the real and virtual environment. Now, optionally, if you have network storage, uh, you can see here right now I just have this blank uh, data store, uh, 1.2 terabytes. But if I want to have additional storage that's on a that's set up for network access, uh, what you can do is go to your storage here. So we'll say add storage. Huh. Um. Well, I was going to say NAS, but I don't see it on here. Let me uh. I'm going to check something else here. Okay, so I just checked on my uh, another VSXI version 6.0, and you can see the storage type has disk and network file system. I was going to show you that, but apparently it's not there. But basically, you just put in the IP and the direction 
location and it'll look something like this. I've never used 6.5, so I'll have to, uh, I'll play around with it. Like I say, this is an uh, impromptu video here. So I guess I won't do that for now. So at this point, I will deploy the OVF I just downloaded. So if I go to my downloads, I've got my viral. All right. And we'll do thick. And here's where you can select uh, this one. We want flat one. And see, it didn't recognize it because I didn't have it capitalized, but it doesn't really matter. And you can actually call these whatever you want. The main thing is these are the VLAN mappings for the different interfaces. So we'll hit next there and finish. And this file was about 5.5 gig. Right here. So, um, I guess I will pause this while this is down or uploading. And uh, th this isn't necessarily anything specifically related, but um, one thing I do have with my home network is uh, I have a dedicated uh, section for, or sorry, I can't talk and type at the same time apparently. I have a dedicated interface uh, on a NIC card on a machine that I have remote I use uh, just VNC for remote desktop too. So if I ever want to do any type of Wireshark capture, um, I can capture on the Wireshark interface. And based on here, this is on uh, GI1025 right now, um, but you can set it to whatever you want. And uh, so we're using GI1023. So if we wanted to, we could actually change this. Or uh, we'll say no monitor source. And so now anything that's going off this interface, um, we'll be able to see oops, uh, traffic. So we hit start. So you can see a lot of broadcast, multicast. Um, but for example, because then if I were to even, let's see, let me open up a different command prompt here. If I were to even ping 10, 10, 10, 7, uh, you can see the ICMP pings come in there. So we stop it now. So it's just kind of cool because, um, you know, you can do your all your pings. And uh, so you go, oops, see if we do the reply. Um, it's handy for troubleshooting. And usually what I'll do is I'll have it on the uplink from my switch to my router. So that way, if um, there's abnormal activity or something weird going on, I can quickly do a centralized uh, packet capture from my switch to this dedicated device and interface. And it's just handy to have. All right, so now this is completed successfully. Uh, oops. First, all, I'm just going to go to edit and we'll change. Uh, it's okay. All right. So that's, we can actually change the hardware version if we want to, um, but I'm going to up the uh, CPUs um, we already set these see it's got uh, doesn't have any CPU force um, hardware reservations but it has 8 gig uh, for the memory and so let's see we'll do ok on there now one thing that I've tend to have to do sometimes is add the uh, virtualization um, embedded 
feature. Uh, let's see. So if we go back up here to configuration and go to security profile, go up to our services and turn on SSH. So we'll start it here. And then let's pull up putty. Oops. So uh, let's see CDVM FS devices. No. Uh, volumes, then data store. Now, if we do change directory and then viral.vmx. Uh, let's see. Okay, it is there. This uh, VHV equal, enable equals true. A lot of times that's not on there. Um, same with the GNS3. Uh, if you download the OVA for that, um, sometimes I have to add that manually, but it doesn't look like I need to do that in this case. So just as a FYI, um, you can add that VHV equals true uh, to then allow embedding uh, or nested VMs because that's essentially what this is. It's a VM within a VM. So uh, we don't need this anymore, so we can go ahead and stop that for security, even though this doesn't have public outside access. But Now if, uh, we can go ahead and open it and start our uh, viral setup. And again, um, this is kind of the baseline, what I want to show you, just like how I set the network interface and why. Uh, there are many different options that you can do, but uh, I just want to get it started here, or at least show you how I'm setting mine up in case you want to set yours up similar. Now while this boots up, one thing I haven't done was check to see if the um, if they've changed any of the install steps because each new version that comes out they add more and more. Um, as far as its different, see this one is for. Mm, For 1026. This is valid for version 1026. Um, but they're saying, let's see, minimum of, of two vCPUs, four gig of memory. Da da da. Let's see what, Okay. Just seeing if there's anything. That has changed. Okay. Yeah, I've, ever since like version zero or something, that part hasn't changed. Static IP, eventually I'll be doing that. Doesn't matter for now. Um, don't have internet proxies. We can validate this part here. Now, usually this boots up really quick. So, let's see. Yeah, and there's hardly any usage going on here. Because normally we get a viral prompt by now, but give it a little bit longer here. I don't know, guys. 
tempted to push this button right here. Then if that doesn't work, I'm tempted to push this button right here. I'm doing it. Totally doing it. wonder if it could be the version of ESXi I'm using too, because I did get that warning when I installed it saying that my processor may not be supported in the future. One way to test is I could install this on version 6 on one of my other servers and see, see if that makes a difference. Alright guys, I am going to deploy this on another server that is the same processor but version six all right so as you can see use another server same CPU this has more memory but same exact CPU and it's version 6 and not 6.5 so and I will also see I have restricted capabilities Same instructions for okay, right. Um, so this is running Virtual Machine 9. What I'm gonna do is just make sure that I set up the new one same 64 gigs of RAM, eight vCPUs. All right, completed successfully. So let's see what happens here. So we're gonna edit. And 64, 8, okay, let's power this on, see what happens. Hmm, alright, I'm going to have to redeploy this on the network file server because I don't have enough memory storage, I should say. Stand by. I think one of the I think the same thing happened in one of my other videos when I was trying to install call manager or something. But hang on, I'm updating this. Alright, it's completed. And here I thought this is gonna be a quick ten minute video and then I'll go to bed. <laughs> right. Alright. So let's uh edit again. And we'll make this 64, 8, okay. All right, drum roll, moment of truth. Let's see how the other one's doing. Still sitting there, so see what happens on this. Same processor, just different version of ESXi. Whoa, look at that. Interesting. So obviously you can tell already it's moving along. See now that's what I expected on this one. Man. I'm probably going to have to reinstall um, ESXi 6 apparently. So let's see.
So that's what you want to see. Acceleration can be used. I figured that would happen. Um, uh, let's see. And if I pull up a browser to 10, 10, 10, 201. I think that's what the IP was, wasn't it? Yeah. There you go. All right. Well, I guess while we're here, um, I can show you real quick how to make a USB bootable media. Let me see if I have one around here. Uh, all right, let me pause the video real quick. Okay, guys. All right, so I've got the USB in, and I am going to download, uh, let's see, version 6. I know this works, so I'm just going to copy this locally. Whenever I download these, I usually save them to my uh, storage server, so I might as well add this one as well. And there are a number of different programs you can use, but the one I tend to use is um, go Universal USB Installer from Pendrive. Um, just scroll down here to this Universal USB Installer right here. And if we run this. What we're gonna do is choose uh, other, or try unlisted Linux. We're gonna browse, and we're gonna choose 6.0. Open, and we're gonna use H, and might as well format it. You don't have to, but I will, just to show you. I'll say yes. So as you see here, it's gonna format it and it's going to burn the image and apologize if it keeps getting noisy in here with my uh, furnace on and my the switch I've been moving my phone lab uh, the collaboration lab directly next to me so when I do these videos uh, I can do more because usually all my lab stuffs in the other room which apparently I'll be giving you a, a tour so so much for my quick 10 minute video but I'll give you a tour of because um, we got to go then and install this and reset this up. All right, installation complete, and you can just click close. And now, broken and we can close this out all right so follow me let's get this reinstalled so we'll take our nifty little USB key here head on into the lab area see it's labeled cave and lab Woohoo! And down here you can see my router and switch with the cable modem and DSL. DSL currently needs the password updated. I'll have that fixed tonight. And who needs a firewall when you have a rock and rider lucky to protect your servers? So put in our USB. Power on the server.
And here's the installer, so we'll just hit enter and you'll see the installer load. Alright, and then we'll just hit enter to continue and F11 to accept the license agreement. And now in this case, we're going to choose the logical volume, 1.23 terabytes, and enter to continue. And in this case, we're going to overwrite the VMFS data store, so we'll select that and hit OK, or return. Then we'll set a, the root password. Enter to continue. And then F11 to begin the installation. And you'll see it install. Now that we're done, we'll hit enter to reboot and remove our USB. Then we'll begin the boot up and startup process. And we'll press F2 to customize our settings. Enter the root username and password. And we'll go down to configure management network and IPv4 configuration. And we'll set the static IP and give it a static IP address. Subnet mask and gateway stay the same. And then we'll hit enter. Then we'll go down to our DNS configuration and change the host name. You can change the DNS servers if you need to as well. And hit enter to save and escape. And then we'll be prompted and we'll say yes to restart management network. And then escape again to back out. And now we're good to go. All right. So now, we're back to where we were when we first started this video. <laughs> oh man, and it's 1 o'clock in the morning. Here I thought it was going to be a quick 10 minute video. But that's okay, I do this for you guys. So now, let's sign back in to our new server. So we're going to have to install a certificate again because it's new. Say yes. All right. So, what are we going to do? Actually, just while I'm here, I'm, I'm curious. Let me check the storage. If I choose uh, add storage, see? There's the network file system. That's interesting. So it's not on 6.5. So that also goes to show, I just downloaded it because I figured I just saw a new version on there, but for production and stuff, you, it's a good idea to read the release notes so things like that don't happen. So I'm going to do, for this one, I'm going to say 10, 10, 10, 6, and uh, I believe it was the shares and VM data store. I'll just call this NAS finish. There we go. So we got our network storage. Um, I guess technically that was a trick question because the first thing I was do is add the networks back. So uh, let's see, we had add new, and we had two hundred was our oops flat was 200 finish add flat 2 flat 1 capital F this time was 201 snet is 202 
And finally, int is 203. I think that's all we want for now. Um, yeah. So we will go back to our file and we'll deploy our OVF template again. See, this time it didn't make me select because it matched exactly with the capital F. So we'll go ahead and deploy this again. And also, I noticed uh, this time there wasn't any message about my processor may not be supported. So again, I have no idea if that has any relevance or not, but just thought that was interesting that I did get that prompt. So it's like, and if that's the case, that's kind of a bummer because the best way for lab stuff is, you know, to buy stuff that's old um, unless, you know, you have bankrolls to buy new stuff. Um, but as you saw, my uh, both my routers and switches, they're all first gen stuff um, that you can get relatively inexpensive on eBay. So, all right, so that's completed. And what are we going to do? That's right. We're going to upgrade the memory. To 64 and now again it doesn't have to be 64 this is just um, just put whatever memory requirements you have and we will click OK now for the moment of truth start this up keep our fingers crossed Hopefully Murphy doesn't follow me again. It's been following me all night apparently. I'm nervous. Well guys, I honestly can say I am not sure. It's probably pat way it's way past my bedtime too. So I at least was able to show you what I wanted to as far as how you do a baseline configured configuration uh, in preparing the network and you saw that uh, at least on the other server with the same processor it worked um, I'm not sure why this is stopping because now on version ESXi 6.0 I was able to add the network storage because uh, that wasn't even an option on 6.5 but I'll mess around with uh, this again tomorrow and I'll uh, do an update if it works <laughs> So I hope at least some of the stuff in here was useful. Okay, so I don't know who I was kidding, thinking I'd be able to go to sleep and just let this go. So I kept tinkering with it. I got it to work, but I honestly don't know why or how. Maybe uh, any of you experts out there might know. Um, all I did initially was I changed this to 32 gig and six CPUs I mean just uh, throw in a dart and then when I started it like this then I went to advanced options and I just hit this I didn't even go to recovery mode I hit the one that's already selected so in theory nothing should have changed but when I did that then I was able to boot it up and then um, I powered it off and then I switched the uh, memory back to 64 gig and 8 vCPUs booted up again and it keeps working every time now so but until I made that initial memory and I don't know if it was the memory or the um, processor change that actually did it or if it was going to the advanced menu even though I already selected the default I, you know it doesn't make a lot of sense as far as what I did to fix it so and it always bugs me too when I don't know why it fixed something um, but maybe I'll do s tomorrow this can wait tomorrow maybe I'll do some uh, I'll redeploy the OVA see if I can reproduce it and uh, and then try those steps manually see if I can figure something out with that but the good news is is it's working now uh, consistently and 
we in theory should just be able to go see 204 uh, oops so now we should at least be able to go to 204 uh, what was that there Uh, all right, so then here is where we can then uh, configure the licensing. So let me secretly fill this out. All right, so there, that's what we want to see. So now we've got successful, and we're good for at least 30 days. And uh, we can actually start our configurations now. Or I, I should say, then we can go through. We can set static IPs if we want for this, um, add the extra software. Um, they actually have web-based uh, they have the, they still have the VM Maestro client, but you can all, they also have a web-based tool now. You can create all your stuff, so that's pretty cool. And I'll have some videos on that. But the main thing that I wanted to show you in this video was the foundations for getting um, ESXi set up for and ready for lab use, and whether you want to use the real and virtual interactions or just you know virtual by itself, and how to set up the networks and or file storage so that was a lot longer than uh, I planned now that it's 2 15 in the morning but uh, again uh, this is all uh, fun to me so and happy to share it with you so thanks for watching and I will see you guys in the next video